the kernel trick. Many classifier problems are not linearly separable, or at least not without some help. But there's a trick, and it's a really good trick, and that's what we're going to look at next. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to change so that y sub j equals 1 if t sub j is in class 1, and y sub j equals negative 1 otherwise. And recall our w is a linear combination of our uh, feature vectors, t1 up to tr our patterns. We're trying to minimize the uh, size of the, the W here, the parameter, and notice that means finding A1 and AR that do this. Where these two conditions hold, W dot T sub J is greater than or equal to 1 if T sub J is a positive, W dot T sub K is less than or equal to negative 1 if T sub K is a negative. Notice that I've changed to Y sub J equals negative 1 instead of Y sub J equals 0 because it's going to allow us to rewrite our uh, conditions as simply y sub j times the quantity w dot t sub j greater or equal to 1 for both the positives and the negatives. So in other words, both those inequalities are implied by this single inequality as long as we have y sub j equals 1 for class 1 and negative 1 for not in class 1. So now we've got this nice little problem. We want to minimize one half w dot w. Uh, the one half there is for mathematical convenience. In particular, take a derivative of something squared, a two pops out, the two and the half will cancel. We won't have to worry about the the constant factor there. And subject to uh, this boundary condition or this constraint. Uh, for all the different features. So let's just remind ourselves of our notation. So a support vector machine, the goal is if it's separable, but not linearly separable, maybe we can project upwards into a much higher dimensional vector space. So we can take our feature vectors and our x's and our parameter vector w and we can go up into a much larger vector space maybe from a 10 dimensional vector space to a 10 trillion dimensional vector space and then apply the linear support vector machine in the 10 trillion dimensional vector space now what we're going to see is that the embedding space to actually pull this off tends to be very very large or even infinite dimensional. Now you can't store things that size in a computer so explicitly doing this embedding is pretty much impossible. But again there's a trick. So linear support vector machine uh, minimize one half w dot w subject to that boundary condition that you see, that constraint. Notice this entire problem depends only on the dot product of vectors. Uh, every vector that occurs inside the problem is actually also inside a dot product. There's no vectors kind of hanging out by themselves. So if we've got w equals k equals 1 to r of a sub k t sub k, the linear combination of the t sub k's, it's the same thing. The uh, only time we see uh, a vector is when it's inside of an inner product and w dot w is a product of the linear or the uh, scalar coefficients a sub j a sub k times a dot product so we can minimize over these scalars uh, a sub j's uh, for j equals 1 up to r uh, and we can rewrite our constraint in terms of the scalars and since now we have a problem that's over scalars, then essentially the number of independent variables, which are the scalars, is equal to the size of the training data. Now, what properties does an inner product have? Well, if you take a basic linear algebra course, they'll tell you something like this. You have to have uh, symmetric uh, 
the inner product of w with itself has to be non-negative. It can be zero only if w is zero. Uh, the inner product is linear in the first argument. Uh, and they'll also explain, you know, that the inner product of w and x is zero only if w and x are perpendicular. Now we can actually get around some of these conditions because we're embedding in a high dimensional space so what we can do is we can say well no training point is going to be mapped to the zero vector so once we do our embedding we're going to avoid the zero vector so now we don't have to worry about the inner product of w with itself is zero only if w is equal to zero uh, the embedding is nonlinear so we're not going to try to preserve linear combinations uh, because we'll be looking at a nonlinear embedding that's being used in an inner product. And we're just going to make sure that once we do the embedding, we don't get any orthogonality. Now that means that we can do the embedding as long as we have symmetric and what's called positive definite or positive semi-definite. In other words, all we need is that the kernel function uh, of w comma x is the same as the kernel of x comma w and that the kernel of w comma w is greater or equal to zero for all w's in this uh, embedding space that we're eventually going to see. So now let's introduce our embedding. That's a mapping phi from r sub n to r sub capital N where the capital N is much much larger than n and in many instances we'll just let capital N be infinity although we won't get into what it means to have an infinite dimensional vector space. So minimizing one half w dot w will be projected into the much much larger space into minimizing one half phi of w dot phi of w. The boundary condition uh, constraint likewise is going to be y sub j phi of w dot phi of t sub j greater than or equal to 1. So we're going to define our kernel to be the dot product of nonlinear uh, or images of w and x under this nonlinear embedding. So k of w of x is equal to phi of w dot phi of x. And that means we want to minimize over the scalars uh, a sub j subject to the boundary condition. And notice that our capital K here is uh, in place of where the inner products were. So the kernel trick is, if we do this, we don't need the mapping phi. We simply need a kernel that has the same properties as phi of w dot phi of x for some extremely large value of capital N. In other words, we have to have uh, k of w x equals k of x w and k of w comma w greater than or equal to zero. So that brings up a thing called Mercer's condition and I'm just mentioning this uh, for completeness. Mathematically it's a little beyond what we're trying to do in this introductory course. But just so you'll know what to think about, main, guaranteeing this uh, k of w dot w or k of w comma w greater than zero, the positive definiteness, uh, is a condition on uh, the the k uh, such that uh, you get for any c1 to c mu in r and any x1 to x mu in r in, uh, this double summation is non-negative. So some commonly used kernels, uh, polynomial you have to specify the degree of the polynomial beforehand. Uh, the radial basis functions, you have to specify uh, the value of sigma beforehand. Both these uh, of these have the nice property that they satisfy Mercer's condition. Now there's also one that's related to what's called a, a neural network we'll see a little bit later called the perceptron kernel uh, which is the hyperbolic tangent of a of w dot x plus b and here, if you're going to use that, you'll have to check and make sure Mercer's condition is satisfied because it's not satisfied for all A and B.
So now we have our support vector machine. Separable training data, where y sub j is 1 if t sub j is in class 1 and y sub j is negative 1 otherwise. We choose a kernel function. It satisfies Mercer's condition uh, and is symmetric. Then we want to find scalar uh, coefficients a1 to ar and notice that this is only the size of the training data not the size of the embedding space so the embedding space can be enormously large but still the number of independent variables for us is only equal to the size of the training data and so here's our problem minimize this uh, one half, uh, sum over j, sum over k, is a sub j, a sub k, times the kernel function of t sub j, t sub k, subject to our condition y sub j, sum k equals 1 to r, a sub k, k of t sub k, comma t sub j, greater or equal to 1. So the embedding doesn't appear explicitly. It's buried inside of this capital K. And that's the trick. And once again, if you have a coefficients uh, which are not zero then those are called support vectors. Now let me mention that this problem while it's a very cool trick it results in a problem which is called a quadratic program and this is a uh, programming problem that's uh, non-trivial but but can be done. So let's look at an example so when we loaded our notebook Notice we get some nonlinear uh, but separable data. And you'll be playing with this when you play with the notebook later on. I'm going to start out with a polynomial kernel, just of degree 2. And it kind of looks like it's a quadratic. And notice it doesn't do a very good job. So the choice of kernel is extremely important. So maybe a kernel 2 is too small. So we can see what happens with a degree of 5. Well, that's a little better. At least it separates them. But it's probably not what we would think would be, quote, most natural. So let's use, uh, instead of a polynomial, let's use a radial basis function. Now this is the one that's used very often. The uh, embedding space is actually infinite dimensional. Uh, and it has this regularization parameter and it actually does a pretty good job but still not necessarily what we want. So we looked at three examples here with two polynomial kernels. The first one didn't work at all. Uh, the second one was better but still sort of a strange classifier. And the third one, the radial basis function, which I supposedly think is the greatest thing since sliced bread, it didn't work very well either. So why not? Well, one thing you have to keep in mind from way back in the earlier part of the course is that even extremely powerful methods can produce very poor or unexpected results. And very often, pre-processing of the data can greatly improve the results. This is a very important theme. Uh, Pre-processing is as important, or even more so in some applications, than the actual algorithms you use. So we're going to look at that. We're going to go back to the notebook, and we're going to notice that the x1s go from negative 2 to 3 or so, but the x2s are an order of magnitude larger. So we're going to pre-process by simply rescaling the x2, so that it more closely aligns with the x1. So we import preprocessing from our sklearn here. We normalize our patterns by rescaling them. Now let's go back to our radial basis function. Oh, that's kind of nice. That's what we would have thought, some sort of uh, parabolic separator here. Okay. So the preprocessing really was a nice uh, feature here. Okay. Now, once we start pre-processing, we also want to be sure that we're not simply getting results from the eyeball test. So we also want to start doing things like cross-validation. 
So now I'm going to look at this again using uh, cross validation and our receiver operating characteristic on the testing data was 0.95. That's that's pretty good. Radio basis function is actually perfect on the test data. So can't ever forget the importance of pre-processing. But of course, once we start pre-processing, we really need some kind of a cross-validation because pre-processing is always uh, a source of bias, or can be. So the kernel trick. It's a really good trick. It can be applied to other algorithms. Uh, we looked already at kernel logistic regression. We could have done a uh, logistic regression in higher dimensions. We could do cosine similarity in higher dimensions by using the trick. Uh, the trick that so when we say a support vector machine, what we really mean is uh, a linear support vector machine plus the kernel trick. And remember, the support vector machine is approximately logistic regression with a very large beta combined with this really good trick, uh, the kernel trick.